Well, um, obviously the similar, similar decree of the Council of Trent has already been studied by a lot of authors, but most of the times the theological formation given to future priests was neglected. And I want to illustrate it by two quotes. The first is from Lodewijk Winkler, a Dutch historian from an article about 19th century theological handbooks in Holland. And he writes in Annals and Memoirs of Priests, including 70 professors, staff members have been characterized, but rarely the content of education has been pointed out. So a lot of, a lot of anecdotes about professors and so on, uh, but not about what they actually taught. And then the other is more recent from uh, the Flemish uh, historian theologian, Marcel Gillis. He wrote a contribution for, for the history of the diocese of Antwerp, but it also applies for other dioceses. Um, we hardly know anything about the study material of the diocese, diocesan seminary, or nor about the orientation of theology. So it is for this reason that I decided to study the dozens of manuscripts with college notes from seminarians in the archives of the former major seminary of Bruges, which have never been the subject of a thorough study or inventory. I will start by giving some key dates of the seminary of the old diocese of Bruges, and we can skip the first century and a half uh, because Bishop de Quinker, you see there on the left column in the middle, decided to close the seminary that was restored after the time of reformation and sent students to either the University of, of Louvain or Douai. Douai, what at the time belonged to the Spanish Netherlands and was a Jesuit stronghold. In 1639, the seminary, after a lot of discussion, was finally closed. And so during 80 years, no seminarians were trained there, although Rome always insisted that the bishops would implement the seminary decree and have a, a seminary in their own diocese. Only in 1719, Bishop van Susteren restored the seminary and quickly moved it to a more adequate building, which is today the bishop's house. The seminary was extended in the middle of the 18th century. And you see in the picture on the right, a drawing of uh, the seminary at the time was from an album presented to Bishop van Susteren at the Silver Jubilee. Um, but then the seminary suffered from um, the government policy to establish a seminary general in Louvain in the 80s. And finally, it was suppressed by the French Revolution. Yeah. The picture here is from the Acta of the Vicariate, chosen after the death of the last bishop, Bernard, and uh, it has six priests and two other people standing in front of them. And of the six priests, four are vicars, chosen uh, as uh, to lead the diocese, and all of them were former members of the staff members of the assembly. One was a president and three were former professors, including Joris, whom I will make, uh, mention later. There were also two secretaries. So as I mentioned, there is uh, in the seminary, there are a president, usually called preses uh, or rector, uh, and two professors. And then this was also something new, uh, thanks to uh, Bishop Van Susteren. There was a canon theologian, Canonicus Theologalis, who was charged with a course on Holy Scripture. And a couple of years later, and a vice president was added, usually a young priest who was mostly in charge of discipline. Originally, the two professors of theology were Dominicans, thanks to um, a foundation by Bishop Johannes de Wette, Dominican Bishop of Cuba, who died in 1540, and he founded two public chairs of theology in Bruges, which were incorporated in the seminary. And in 1722, the Dominicans were replaced by secular priests. And you see in the picture on the picture on the right, um, the first page, the title page of the first theological thesis defended in the seminary in March, 1721. And at the time they were still presided over by a Dominican, Oliver Smithson, 
And as you see, the content is also mainly about St. Thomas Aquinas, but then this quickly changed. Now I want to present my main sources, the college notes. When Bishop de Castillon, the successor of Hans Susteren, asked his parish clergy at the visitation in 1745, 1746, which biblical and theological comments they used, three priests responded by referring to their own notes from the seminary. And catalogs of book auctions of clerical libraries often also contained series of theological manuscripts, probably college notes, but sadly all those I found mentioned uh, either in this visitation report or in the catalogs of book auctions uh, have been lost. Many college notes from other seminaries or Faculty of Theology of Louvain, of course, survive, but sadly none of these have been studied before. Um, I have listed here a couple of uh, examples. Uh, the, the one from Brussels I will show you immediately and then on the next slide, but there is also an example from Liege, from Marlin, uh, uh, a treatise on marriage, which is actually a handwritten copy, mostly from a handbook by the rector of the Seventy Peter's Zens. And we can also find college notes of the same period on the website of Magister Dixit uh, from a student named Hubertus Dubois, but it is not mentioned from which uh, institution, either university or college or somewhere on a seminary. This is the example from Brussels, um, the Royal Library. It's the title page uh, you see is from College Notes on uh, Grace by Professor Christiano Stersoak, who was a professor of theology in Leuven, of Louvain, and he was also a non-resident canon in the cathedral in Bruges. No date or name or uh, of the copyists uh, are mentioned. There is on the right corner, uh, you can see the ex libris of rector, uh, of former rector de Ram of the University, University of Louvain. And there's also a note by the same hand on the bottom of the page, Hex Scripta Continent, Genoinam Lovanin Niensis Faculta de Theologie Systema de Gratia. So it's the typical Louvain system of the theology of grace. Uh, Jan Rohirs in his doctorate has referred to another uh, treatise by the same professor, which was owned by uh, Rector de Ram and, and mentioned in the catalog of his book auctions, but it was lost, but this is a, a kind of smaller version which Rohirs has mentioned in an article in 1994. Um, according to the inventory, there are some 70th century college notes in the archives of the state, the Rijks Archief in Bruges. You see here an example on this and the next slide. Again, the origin is not mentioned. No, not the author or the copies are unknown, no date. In fact, there is no clear link with the assembly of Bruges or with Bruges at all. It may also, it may also become a, a originate from a convent. What we have is a fragment of a treatise on creation. Also here on the left part, you see another page from it. And on the right side, you see possibly notes, personal notes or college notes. It's not very clear about uh, books of the Holy uh, Bible, maybe for of a priest preparing for his sermon or something like that, or a student. But uh, since there is so little information of, of this, uh, about his manuscripts, uh, I cannot use them for my own uh, research. On the other hand, there are some 80th century uh, college notes in the archives of the seminary in Bruges of the Diocese of Ypres, which was another diocese in Western Flanders. You see here the title page of one of the treatises left behind by an important uh, Canon from uh, Ypres, uh, canon theologian Johannes Bartholomeus van der Rohe. And there are also notes on pastoral theology from, from him and on theology uh, from uh, Professor de Dour and on the Holy Scripture from the Grison. So they cover the second part of the 18th century. Here again on the next page, you see two other examples uh, from courses given by van der Rohe. On the left side, there is a uh, from a um, course on uh, the impediments for marriage or uh, 
And on the right hand, there is a, an incomplete uh, treatise on pastoral theology, which is, has been mentioned by Dr. Russ Harpelink in her study about the Diocese of Ypres in the late 18th century. But as you can see, uh, it stops with Article 2. Uh, so this, the text is not complete. So let, um, let's finally turn to the uh, summary of uh, the roots. Actually, no college notes preserved are we having preserved from almost the entire first half of the century after the assembly was reopened. So the assembly was reopened in 1719. We have no uh, notes of the, uh, the of its predecessor, nor from the first half uh, century. But then we have a number of college notes and I've listened to years there, uh, 1766, 1767, mostly from 1779, of 1775, sorry, to 1783. And there are a couple of uh, manuscripts which are slightly younger or later. On the right hand, you see uh, uh, one of the last pages from the oldest manuscript. Um, all courses in uh, the seminary of Bruges, of which we have notes, have been taught by three priests and they are easy to identify because uh, most of the times the names are written on the notes. The first one uh, is Franciscus Josephus van der Poole. His curriculum is entirely in Bruges. Uh, he studied uh, in mostly in Louvain, uh, but he returned to the seminary in 1741 to defend theological theses. Actually, we have a, a very in, interesting series of theological theses, which kind of compensate for the loss of the college notes because they cover almost the, the entire 18th century. Um, he was, the day before Bishop Francisco died, he received his dimissorialis, so the, the, the written uh, permission to be ordained in another diocese, but we don't know where he has been ordained. Uh, then he came canon in another chapter in Bruges and sufficient in, in the seminary and only later on in 1716, he became canon theologian and also finished his license of theology in Louvain. What is also striking is that we know that several times he uh, had uh, uh, bad eyes yeah? and for, for some reason, so for, at some times apparently his eyes were so bad that his courses were taken over by the subregent, uh, first Moons and then later on Bouva. But still, he, in a, in a way, he managed to return on, to teach and he continued to teach until he died in 20, on the 26th of March in 1791. He even left a handwritten uh, testament uh, and I can't see any problems in his handwriting of nothing which uh, points to his bad eyes anyway. According to one of his former pupils, pupils who left the Chronicle, Arnold de Souquet, together with two of the former presidents of the seminary, he was uh, one of the three very great theologians of the seminary. But uh, remarkably enough, uh, he was forgotten very quickly. Of course, the seminary was suppressed. And in uh, publications about the seminary in the 19th century, he is hardly ever mentioned. The second professor of whose college, uh, obviously, we have notes preserved, is Willem Brodus Joris, he was originally from the Diocese of Antwerp, yeah? so he was not a student of the seminary at all, but he had trained like Van der Poelen in Leuven. He became a professor in the seminary and then continued to make his career in Bruges as a canon, left the seminary to become an archpriest and ended as uh, dean uh, in uh, Bruges. And he died in 87. We have here a, a copy of uh, one of the treatises uh, taught by Joris, but his name has been written uh, with two O's uh, by the student. Then the last or the third professor which I have to present is Bernardus Josephus Muns. Interestingly enough, he started his studies in Douai and he even started also theology there, but then switched to Louvain where he obtained his license. Then became sub regent and professor in the seminary and as I mentioned, at some point took over the course of Van der Poelen. Then he left the seminary to become a rural dean in, and a parish priest, but he returned to the seminary in 1791 uh, and stayed there until it was uh, uh, suppressed. On the right, you see a fragment of uh, 
like the chronology of moons in the journal Historic, Historic Literaire, uh, which mentions his career, but the, the orange line is the only reference I have found to Van der Poelen uh, from the 19th century. Then again, I will try to act quickly. We have also uh, the note takers or the copyists. Again, it is possible to identify most of them because they have left uh, enough their names or other information to identify them. The first one is Bartholomeus Josephus Spreut, as you can see from his curriculum. That was quite long because he started his studies in Louvain in 1763, and he only got his first official assignment in 1777. So he spent almost 14 years studying, and we do know that the college notes after three or four years were repeated. So and um, uh, we also have we have two manuscripts from him. One dates from uh, before his ordination, 1771, and one is from the period after his ordination, and it also includes a nice uh, chronogram and you see here the um, um, concluding page. Um, what is characteristic of this manuscript is that, uh, especially the, the oldest one, is really uh, assembled by all kinds of different uh, types of paper. Some had been recycled, uh, had been partly written on. Uh, I counted eight different sizes. Uh, you can see it on the right corner, uh, where uh, um, a piece of the, the, the corner has uh, been uh, ripped off. Uh, and the text is complete. So the, 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 obviously, the copies start to take a note before the, the page was damaged. Um, he also uses a lot of symbols, uh, like the ones mentioned by the yellow lines, uh, a small circle with a, a bar, uh, which means none. Uh, so to be to take and a lot of abbreviations also to, to be quick in taking notes. Also, a lot of texts have been deleted or corrected, so sometimes it is difficult to read. Uh, and the structure of the notes is it's a bit different from the later ones because it is divided in observaciones and paragraphs, while the others use uh, titoli and capitoli and paragraphs. Then we turn to the second note taker, who is anonymous. He left a complete series of uh, uh, college notes in a very clear and neat handwriting, but I've been able to identify his name by matching his. Uh, these manuscripts to his hand, uh, uh, to his signature in a register of oaths and other documents of the same period. So his Philippus Dumont, uh, who studied also mainly in Leuven and in, in the seminary, but contrary to most of the copies, he also defended theological thesis, which was mostly reserved for better students, and he was also able to write words in Greek. Uh, of course, most of the the the, the, the college notes are almost entirely written in Latin. Sometimes there are references to Greek, uh, but always transcribed. Here we have uh, the word, Greek word homagion on a, in, uh, written in Greek. Uh, Hebrew is abs absent from the college notes, I must, uh, must uh, admit. Also in the theological thesis, I have found examples of words printed in Greek. Uh, um, because this uh, series of notes is so complete and also very uh, neat and uh, visible, readable, uh, I have used these as uh, the standard version to uh, compare other versions. Then we have uh, two uh, anonymous uh, copies again. Uh, we have one manuscript from about the same period of uh, um, Dumont which can be attributed to Johannes Surmont because he left uh, a note, you see it on the bottom, about his ordination as a deacon. So it was uh, easy to find his name in the register of ordinations or, or uh, who he was. Uh, like the first uh, manuscript, we had, there are a lot of, a lot, lot of abbreviations, uh, but no uh, corrections or uh, things deleted. So it was a very neat version uh, of the notes. 
Then we have another anonymous uh, um, seminarian, but he can be identified because we know obviously when he was in the seminary and uh, uh, we can uh, match his handwriting again, Peter Francisco Calawa. Um, he left almost an entire series of uh, notes. You see here the, uh, they are numbered one to nine. You see on the, the right, the cover of part nine, but also you see that uh, part four uh, has been uh, lost. The uh, cover mentions theolog theologia, theologia so practica, it should be, sorry, there's a mistake there, which is also used in the notes of Dimon, uh, which is the title of the notes of Dimon, theologia practica, practical theology. And then we have some other copyists, which I have to uh, mention, uh, as there was one volume missing from the notes of Calawart, I supplied it by uh, a volume from another series left by Francis, Franciscus Antonius van Maldegem of the same period. And then they have two other uh, copies of, this, of the same time, which I didn't use, but I didn't, there is one last manuscript, which was discovered not so long ago in a presbytery in the Diocese of Ghent and has been written by Peters Ray Frank, but it is very incomplete because it contains only three treatises and one on the Eucharist is uh, incomplete, maybe because the author left the seminary. Um, so before coming to the, uh, the results of my research, I already mentioned that uh, not all verses are complete. So the only the second version is actually very complete and offers a good basis for research. The oldest and the third version uh, are very partial, but uh, are useful to compare to other versions. The fourth version lacks one volume, yeah, which, can be, which can be compensated by uh, another manuscript from another copyist. But here we have to point to a lot of writing or copyist errors. I have also um, pictured one of the errors, which are quite obvious uh, in the, because here they mentioned, and it's from the, uh, um, the notes on, uh, on fate, on, on the, um, the errors uh, of Hus and uh, Miklef, he writes, obviously it's, it's about Johannes Hus and John Wycliffe, uh, but apparently he was not very good at names. Also, we see that sometimes Latin words, which were not recognized by students, were uh, also written uh, in a wrong way. And we will see other examples of mistakes when uh, I mention the names of uh, councils. With this in mind, I will now move on to presenting some results of my research. I have uh, divided this in three sections according to the subject that was thought, scripture, history, and theology. So I start with uh, biblical instruction. We have only one manuscript, one small manuscript with notes on the Holy Scripture, which has no clear structure. It doesn't mention any scholars or comments. And it, is also, it has also no name, but uh, uh, since it, it's in, an, in a manuscript of 1782 with another, uh, uh, treatise, it can be attributed to uh, Professor Munz. It proceeds in a way like uh, uh, with questions and answers, with a lot of uh, texts are repeated literally. Yeah? The focus is mainly on the Gospels and Genesis, and again we find some words that have, are, are obviously wrong, like apocryphus instead of apocryphus. There is no attention for biblical languages, the original text, and so on. But we have also some other theological theses on the Bible, five all in all, covering both, both the Old and the New Testament. And there, there is, we do have uh, some interest given to questions of biblical chronology and also to the difference between the Latin, Hebrew, or Greek versions of the Bible. The treatise on faith also has a paragraph on Bible reading in the vernacular language, which was restricted by the fourth rule of the Council of Trent. It is clear that the Vulgata, this Latin version, was still considered to be the most authentic and sometimes even original version of the Bible. 
I have also made a comparison between biblical comments present in clerical libraries in the middle of the 18th century and those mentioned in the college notes. While by far the most popular author in libraries of parish clergy was the Jesuit Jacobus Tyrinus. He is absent from the college notes. The author mentioned in most treatises, namely four, is another Jesuit, Martinus Vicanus. Second comes a professor in Douai, Guillermus Estius, with two treatises and joined third are two bishops, Cornelius Jansenius of Ypres and Jacob, Jacob Bossuet of Meaux, both with one treatise. Of course, the small number of references to biblical comment doesn't really uh, allow us to make many conclusions about the popularity of the authors mentioned here or the absence of other authors, like for instance, uh, Cornelius Alapide. It is also worth noticing that they all lived in the 16th and 17th centuries. So there are no references to contemporary biblical scholars in the college notes. On the curriculum of seminaries in the 18th century featured no separate course of church history, although one of the first uh, secular uh, priests of uh, um, the, the college of the seminary was uh, uh, Johannes Foppens was a productive historian, uh, but uh, Johannes Franz Foppens. Uh, the college notes like to quote historical texts. Here you see an example of uh, a declaration of Paul Benedict XIV on marriages in Holland or by Dutch inhabitants in the Austrian Netherlands, which had uh, was the result of a, a letter of the Bishop of Ypres, and so it was also studied in. Brooch. Also, for instance, the statements of uh, the, the assemblies of the French clergy on paper and infallibility have been mentioned. There are also many references to liturgical books, sometimes even in a specific edition, for instance, the Sacramentary of Gregory the Great, where it is added that it has been published in Paris in 1675, and then so obviously also some Roman books. Um, um, as I mentioned, there are also a lot of uh, references to ecumenical and local councils. On the left side, you see the ecumenical councils, uh, of course, all the great councils, both of the antiquity and the medieval period have been mentioned. And of mm -hmm. certainly also trend uh, with a lot of exact references, but also the, uh, its predecessor, the, the fifth Lateran council. What is interesting is the whole series of local councils, provincial councils, or uh, local synods, beginning with Eldira around 300, and then they have an, a number of other uh, local councils. Uh, here again, the problem is sometimes that uh, names have been, or years have been wrongly uh, understood. Uh, uh, also, are sometimes are not easy to identify. For instance, I have found a reference to a synod in the uh, notes on uh, confirmation, which I haven't so far been, not been able to identify. Again, we have also some uh, differences between uh, manuscripts. On the left side, for instance, there is a reference to the Concilio Carta Sinensi. Uh, the name again is wrong, written, uh, written wrong, with uh, and the, the date is different from the one in on the left, on the on the right. Uh, from, Sorry, good. Sorry to interrupt you, but um, we see that uh, we have uh, well half an hour passed. Uh, yeah. Are you coming to a conclusion? You yes, think? Yes, I will. I will, I will move on quickly. With you. here again, you have some other uh, examples okay. of uh, uh, Thank mistakes. Thank you. In, okay, uh, mistakes We've... in the college notes. Um, yeah. Just to know. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And then uh, I just show some historians. I, well, I'm sorry to. I won't be able to, and this is an interesting, interesting case because he will, he see about the way uh, uh, histories are being used. And the source is the uh, book by a Dominican author, Ludovicus uh, Lod. Uh, it's about by a kind of uh, rather bizarre story of a, a boy born from a man's hip in Vladslo. And it is used both in theological treatises and in the treatise on, on baptism, but in theological treatises, it has also has historical, uh, uh, also theological questions are being asked why in the, in the treatise on baptism only, there is only the question is, is has, if such a child has to be uh, 
baptized. Coming now to theology, uh, I show you again uh, an, an, uh, a picture from manuscript where there is a reference to Peter's dance. Uh, the Bishop Bernard had prescribed that this treatise had to be used in a seminary uh, in, the, in the, the 80s, but we don't have any example uh, of its use in the seminary. The number of theologians quoted in the, in the college notes, Professor, the, 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 the most popular one is a professor of Leuven, uh, Martinus Steart, followed by the, the, the theologian from Douai, Silvius, and then we have some other names, Dalman uh, uh, from Leuven, Dominican, Dujardin, and then a lot of other uh, names I, will, I won't uh, mention in detail. Uh, also some more recent authors, also 8th century authors uh, I have mentioned there. Um, the college notes are built in a scholastic way with questions, objections. And so the object of Kichitur, you see there with a the yellow line, this is, and then the response uh, is given by the professor himself. Argumentations are strengthened by reference to the Bible, church fathers, uh, especially since St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, councils, paper centuries, and other authors. Distant views, views are studied as such, but strongly condemned. Uh, an example we see, for instance, in the uh, treatise on grace, uh, there the, the condemnation of Jansenius is mentioned uh, as such, while, for instance, in the treatise on grace by Professor de Swag, he really analyzes what, the, what uh, Jansenius has taught and tries to, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, oh, I've been too quick now <laughs> um, to, 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 to enter in, in discussion with Jan Senius. Uh, I, uh, I have come to my conclusions. The theological analysis mainly wants to explain the Christian faith to prepare, to prepare future pastors. Uh, students are reminded of the lack of knowledge of some of their flock, the so-called Rudy, uh, which asks for a careful approach. Uh, in the treatise on sacraments, the focus is on practical issues. It seems priests were primarily trained to be able to repeat the sacramental rites without making mistakes that would invalidate the sacrament. And much attention is given to practical conclusions. As I mentioned, the title was also Theologia Practica. There is no indication that a specific Theologia Brugensis, different from, for instance, Louvain or other seminaries, was taught. Uh, um, but it is clear that the college notes offer an interesting view on the, of the opinions that were taught to 80th century seminarians. Thank you for your attention and excuse me for being a bit too long. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, well, a, a specific case and uh, I presume there are some uh, questions on uh, this uh, kind of uh, student notes and um, lecturers. Where do we see a hand? Okay, Anne, please. Thank you so much. I had a couple of quick questions about the cost of paper, uh, which of course gets a lot of attention in general. We say the paper was very expensive and that's why we're using mm. scrap paper in this case, for example. Mm. And yet there's new work being done, emphasizing at least in England that paper wasn't all that expensive unless you were a printer, in which case you needed a lot of paper. Yeah. So I'm curious whether this is something that um, we know anything about, you know, did the seminary buy paper and distribute it to the students, so that kind of thing. I also had a question in general, your, your examples are quite late. And um, is that because of the history of the, I mean, why are there, is there a bias toward later notes? Is there some way to explain that? Uh, and then finally, if I may, I have a very selfish question. Uh, could I share my screen? I think I can share my screen. I noticed you let me. I'm wondering, oh, Oh, I can't share screen while you're sharing screen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what what, what notice it is? I uh, wanted to just show you a, a portrait I have ah, of a yeah. Bruges um, theologian mm -hmm. who is of interest to me because um, he has a secretary mm -hmm. and the uh, lexicon identifies mm -hmm. the, the man as a Jesuit, La Fe. I follow that up, it does not seem to be plausible. But I'm wondering if there's any way um, that we can identify from his dress or collar or anything here, 
who this might be. Yeah. Not something to answer for now. I didn't yes. want to just put it out there. I will stop my show. Thank you very much. Wonderful. <laughs> yes, uh, great. <laughs> well, to, to, start, to start with the first question, um, I haven't thought if there is any information. There is, the, there is some uh, um, information about the resources of the seminary and the expenses. Uh, we, we have, of course, we have lists of scholarships to give it to students. But I don't know if paper or so is mentioned there. But it's ob certainly obvious from the first college notes, the oldest one, that uh, the student try to uh, make as much use uh, of paper as as possible. Uh, um, so maybe for uh, financial reasons, that could, could be could uh, be. The reason why my examples are indeed late is that I haven't found any uh, uh, college notes that are from an earlier period. There may be some left elsewhere, uh, but uh, so far they didn't turn up. And in, in December, you have no uh, examples from the early in the in the 18th century, let alone from the 17th century of um, a small period at the time that the seminary also existed. And I must admit, I don't recognize the painting you, you have shown us, but I can maybe I can uh, try to contact some uh, some uh, art historians in Bruges, but uh, it doesn't look familiar to me. <laughs> Thank you very much. If anyone else has any ideas, please email me. <laughs> okay, we will all look for that one. Uh, I see a question from uh, Yannick, please. Hi, uh, yes, thank you for your presentation. I was wondering because um, from this presentation, it's kind of obvious that uh, biblical or any biblical studies obviously played like a more secondary role. And because we've seen a lot of treatises and we've seen that there's professors for dogmatic theology and the sacraments. And I was just wondering as to why uh, this is the case and if you have any hypothesis as to why biblical studies wasn't as, or doesn't seem to have been as important um, relating to the, you know, the preparations of priests and, and what their tasks might be yeah. later on in their career. Well, this subject has been studied by Jan Rugiers, and he said that uh, clearly in, uh, in the Levain Faculty of Theology, um, there was more interest for, for Bible studies. We also see it from the theological thesis. And uh, for students from, the, from Holland who were trained in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in Leuven had to take even extra courses on the Bible because the vicars in Holland were afraid that they wouldn't be able to uh, discuss with Protestant ministers in Holland because they needed to increase their knowledge of the Bible. So clearly there was indeed a lack of uh, biblical scholarship uh, in, uh, uh, at least according to Jan Rugiers in, in his doctorate in it is the days from 1970, but there has been a lot of been published, has been published on that matter uh, after that. Uh, and on the seminaries, well, yes, uh, it's clear that uh, the Bible was not the most uh, uh, students had the Bible, of course, and they were even allowed uh, to, to, to read the Bible in vernacular uh, for, uh, for catechetical reasons and so on, or prepare a homily. Uh, but on the whole, uh, it was not, and in a way, it's, it's clear there is no, uh, no real critical exegesis, of course, the uh, we, we can't hard what is mentioned, what said, what is said about different versions of the of the uh, of the Bible uh, or the original languages. We can hardly call it uh, biblical exegesis or uh, uh, critical exegesis. Yeah. 